Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Back with us today is our favorite doctor, Dr. Elena. We are going to be discussing fall prevention, which as most of you should know, a fall is what caused my mother to finally pass away from Alzheimer's. So it's a, it's a very important topic. So thanks for joining me, Elena, once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to see you again. You too. One of my favorite topics. <laughs> oh, yes. I I do get that from your Instagram posts. After the constipation. As <laughs> you know, we geriatricians all obsessed with constipation. <laughs> well, it's pre-lunchtime here, so let's go back to falls. <laughs> Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> so you've had some interesting cases surrounding falls. You want to talk about any of those real quick, and then we can jump into preventing them? Yes, Jenny, I see patients being admitted with falls every single day. And there are certain patterns in, in the falls, but um, every patient is individual, and every single one of them has to have a personalized approach to their falls management. One of the struggles I have in acute hospital setting, um, which I see non-geriatricians adopting that approach, is assigning the fall to one single medical problem. For example, I'll give you a, a very recent example. It was this week a patient with vascular dementia was admitted to hospital with a fall. Unfortunately, she broke her pelvic bone. Mm -hmm. And when she, she was seen and spent a couple of days in the acute assessment unit and then came down to my uh, geriatric ward, and her diagnosis was urinary tract infection, and the cause of her fall was thought to be secondary to that urinary tract infection. But of course... Let's face it, how many of us haven't had urinary tract infection? I had two episodes last year, Jenny. I don't know about you. Did I go around and fall with my urinary tract infection? <laughs> no. So why are we making an assumption that an older person with dementia had a fall because she had a urinary tract infection, UTI? That's misconception. And I'm fighting it day in and day out because if you don't get to the bottom why this patient had fallen and urinary tract infection probably was that final straw in the cascade of events which led to the fall, unless you go through every event and address the problems, the patient will continue falling. And just giving antibiotics to urinary tract infection is not going to solve the problem of recurrent falls. That makes sense. My mom, well, my mom was fighting with the caregivers. That's why she fell. But I don't think I have had any of my caregiver friends or listeners indicate that a UTI caused a fall. That doesn't, I don't, I don't follow that quote logic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the infection makes uh, confused, people confused. So, and if you have dementia, of course, the infection will make you even more confused than you are. But you're absolutely right. The, the falls are multifactorial. If our listeners to take one message from today's session is to remember the falls are multifactorial and whoever is assessing your mom or dad, you need to challenge the practitioner to give you at least three causes for their falls and try to address them, at least three. But if I am addressing my patients, I can come up at least with five, six causes. And I'll get back to our patient with vascular dementia, Jenny, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So in her case, the causes of her falls, she had a brain scan um, to make sure that she didn't have a bleed on the brain after the fall. And the brain scan showed quite advanced furring and hardening of the blood vessels on the brain. And of course, that, called in medical terms, small vessel disease, can cause balance problems. Now, that's number one. Dementia itself is the independent risk factor. Although the same small vessel disease causes the vascular dementia, the dementia itself is an independent risk factor for falls because people with dementia have reduced 
safety awareness. They cannot appreciate the risks around us. The type of risks, if you are walking across the room and you see telephone cables on the floor or via or carpets or whatever, you will be careful. You will be maybe lifting your foot a bit higher. Uh, the people with dementia do not recognize. They have reduced safety awareness and they trip over. Um, so that was number two in my patient. Number three, she was clearly over medicated with uh, psychotropic drugs. She was on the likes of diazepam, um, various uh, sleeping tablets, psychotropic medications, antidepressants, loads of blood pressure medication. So polypharmacy was a huge problem in her case. Number three. Number four, she was suffering with osteoarthritis of her knees. One knee was replaced 10 years ago. The other knee needs replacing, but she is now um, too dangerous to put her through surgery, so they can't operate on her, and knee gives way. And it goes on, Jenny. I can talk about this patient. I can come up at least with 10 reasons for her. Uh, why is this important? Yeah, once you put all these reasons together and you have the bullet points, you can now look at every one of them and address them. So what can we do about, for example, reduce safety awareness? Yeah, get a good occupational therapist into the house and look around and maybe remove all the cables off the floors, get the, get rid of the carpets, you know, maybe have the rails around the walls and things like that, if that's what the problem is. Uh, I chucked away half of her medications. I cut down uh, her polypharmacy, yeah, and, and, and so on. That's a lot. And your husband's a pharmacist, so you always getting rid of medications is kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, we bounce ideas of each other all the time. He's a cardiology pharmacist, so sometimes he gets uh, worried when I touch their cardiology drugs, but I can always justify it. And he mainly deals with younger patients, so he can't quite appreciate that the same cardiac drugs, which helped my patient in the last 25 years, to come to reach the age of 90, now causing a problem. And it's not a crime to get rid of these medications. And a lot of families would say, oh, my God, oh, my God, mom has been on that drug for years and years and years, and now you are suggesting to stop the drug. Well, the drug done its job. Your mom in her 90s. Now what that drug will do? Break her hip. Yeah, the over-medication Major um, polypharmacy is one of the main causes of recurrent falls, and it kills people. Yeah. Pelvic, our patient was lucky enough just to break her pelvic bone. Uh, if she broke her hip and she needed to go through surgery under general anesthetic, I assure you, Jenny, the statistics are very clear. She would not have survived beyond three to six months because general anesthetic um, it affects the brain and in patients with dementia, it precipitates acute delirium. It really leads to rapid decline of dementia. And it, it really is, I, I always say, hip fracture is beginning of the end, really, in our patients. That's what happened with my mom. She didn't break her hip. She broke her the, the bone right under her kneecap. She landed mm -hmm. on her kneecap. So she broke, what is that one? The tibia? I can't. I'm yeah. Not, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I was like, glad I remembered that. And I knew from basically talking to other caregivers that anesthesia was definitely not a good idea for somebody with advanced Alzheimer's like my mom. And thankfully, the surgeon didn't press to do the surgery. Mm. I think he understood that, although they don't, they never really admitted it. And I was really surprised that her neuro uh, neurologist said, oh, no, the brain clears out the anesthesia. And I'm like, not in somebody that's had Alzheimer's <laughs> for 20 years. Yeah. And so yeah. I thought that was very strange. So I appreciate that you actually stated all of that, because at least on this side of the pond, on this side of the country, <laughs> They don't really mm. admit to that. And it's frustrating. You know, a lot of doctors over here will say, no, it's okay. It's fine. Or we can do this or do that. And it's like, 
I just knew in my heart that it was the wrong move with my mom and she would have been, she would have needed uh, physical therapy with or without the surgery. And since she swatted away the physical therapist, the first time he came over, I was like, well, there's no sense in doing surgery, especially mm. if she won't let him help her. So, <laughs> and mm. then she, she broke her leg March 8th and died March 31st, 2020. So it happened mm. pretty quickly. So, and I, I, hope, I, I, I hope it was very peaceful. It was. She yeah. just, she mostly just started sleeping more and more. She wasn't eating or drinking. So that was mm -hmm. the, her death certificate said, essentially in medical speak that she died from lack of food and, and hydration due to advanced Alzheimer's. I had to look it up because I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure that her death certificate basically said that she passed away from Alzheimer's. Cause I know a lot of people, their death certificates don't, it says everything else, but that's what she had. That's what, you know, yeah. that's why she didn't yeah. make it to 78. So Mm -hmm. Anyway, and what's interesting when you were talking about rails in the home, and I bet you a lot of people not I, I would have been one of them would have been like, oh, I don't want those ugly things in my house where my mom lived. They had very wide, probably three and a half to four inch trim at hand level along the wall. So it was like a woodworking trim. So it looked very nice, but it was very beneficial to those that needed a little balance help. Uh, those that were in wheelchairs could actually use it to help propel themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. you would not have, I didn't really, I don't even, I'm assuming that it was there for that purpose, but in my eyes, it was just there for decoration. So you can, mm -hmm. you can do things in your home that look nice and are still beneficial to those of us that plan on aging really long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to live yeah. past 77, that's for sure. <laughs> I wanted to get back to that point. You um, spoke about the neurologist who said that, don't worry, it will clear out of, it, of her brain. Well, I, I mean, I, I disagree with that. I'm, I'm sorry to all the neurologists out there, but with 20 years of experience, 15 of them as a geriatrician, I see complete opposite. Of course, it depends on the severity of underlying dementia. And the more severe dementia is, the less likely anesthetic to clear out. I mean, it does clear out of their brain, no doubt about that. Of course, every drug gets metabolized and gets out of the body. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about, that anesthetic precipitates the acute confusion, the delirium. And it is the delirium takes a long, long time to clear. And depending on the degree of underlying, on the severity of underlying dementia, it, the people after general anesthetic might, if the dementia was very mild, they might recover within several weeks. If, or if it was moderately severe, they might recover a little, get halfway through, or if dementia was uh, really bad, the, this new level of confusion precipitated by the general anesthetic could in fact be their new baseline. So the families should be prepared that their mom, who is coming out of general anesthetic, really confused, they might never recover. They, that could be their new baseline. So something to bear in mind. Here uh, in United Kingdom, we have so-called POPs clinics. Uh, POPs, uh, it's a geriatric clinic, stands for pre-operative assessment of all the adults, where a team of geriatricians with physiotherapists and occupational therapists, in fact, do a full thorough geriatric assessment of people who go for surgery. And we do all our sort of there are various calculators and assessments where we advise the family, what is the risk for that? What is the risk for this? And we advise whether it's um, sensible to go for surgery or not. We optimize patients prior to the surgery. Uh, with fractured hip, it's more difficult. Obviously, it's acute problem. Somebody's fallen, broken their hip, you go for surgery. But if someone with dementia is going for surgery, let's say planned surgery, knee replacement, hip replacement, or maybe cancer surgery, that patient here in United Kingdom, they will see a geriatrician first. 
have their medicines reviewed, um, optimized. If they're a bit anemic, they might need blood transfusion, iron infusion, and so on and so forth. So we make them as much as we can really fit for that surgery and get that brain stronger to go through the general anesthetic. So a bit of a, I guess, different approach, but I'm sure that's a common practice. And uh, probably uh, I I would be surprised if uh, you don't have their so-called POPs, you know, preoperative geriatric assessments in states as well. Um, I'm not geriatric yet, so I'm not sure. Presumably, you never saw a geriatrician, Jenny, when your mom fractured her hip. Did you see a geriatrician Mm -mm. talking through things with you? No. Okay. She was in the hospital, and I talked to the emergency room physician in person and then the surgeon on the phone. Because this was at the very beginning of the pandemic. So I was Mm -hmm. okay with talking to people from a distance. Mm -hmm. And normally, Surgeons like to do surgery. I'm sure it's the same over there. Yeah, um, over, exactly. Exactly. We call them um, plumbers. You know, they they do their 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 plumbing or you know, <laughs> a building work, and uh, and then that that's it. We geriatricians take over. Well, this guy was not. He was fine either way. You know, I asked him what was the outside limit to my being able to decide which way we were going to move forward. Cause I wasn't going to make that decision just right off the bat. I mean, and I knew that I don't really, I'm assuming it's through all the work that I do. Cause it wasn't from the doctors, but I knew anesthesia was not a good idea, but she had been mobile prior to the fall. She did not need any aids for walking you know, she didn't have balance issues. She had vision issues because of the Alzheimer's. It made her see things funny, which sometimes was frustrating and sometimes was kind of entertaining. It was very funny when she tried to avoid walking on her own shadow. <laughs> Try that. Well, That's very challenging. Like that, things like that precipitate the falls, don't they? Uh, well, Jenny, was, there is something, something was, important I'd like to mention before we move on. Okay. And that. That, that is about surgery or no surgery. I, I think uh, our listeners need to know that in many cases, the, uh, with fractured hips, even in people with dementia, with frailty, the fractured hip does have to be operated on because it could be a palliative procedure. It is a palliative procedure in some really frail patients. The reason being is even if that person has only two, three weeks, four weeks to leave, it will be extremely difficult to nurse that person with a fractured hip because we have to move people to avoid pressure sores. Also, it's extremely painful to be there with fractured hip. So it's, of course, dependent on the person. And unless my patient is going to die, it's so bad that going to die in the next day or two or three, I probably would like that person to have the surgery. As I said, hip surgery can be a palliative procedure because we have to nurse these patients, continue nursing them for the next two, three, four weeks. Uh, And we can't nurse them with fractured hip. It's very painful. I believe that. Mm. So we have to go back a little bit on fall prevention. (laughs) My mouth. Yes. Yes, yes. So false prevention. Yes, that's that's very important. So um, false prevention. The main thing is usually the false prevention starts when the fall happened. And then we put in place uh, loads of things to prevent further falls. But once that first fall happened, it puts so much fear and anxiety into the person that it's very difficult to rehabilitate them sometimes. I mean, I had people with extreme anxiety who become housebound after the first fall. So, of course, it's very important to even prevent that first fall, realize that the risk factors are there, and put everything in place to prevent the first fall. So what do we do? Um, If we take patients with dementia, uh, let's say your mom or dad received a new diagnosis of dementia and Jenny and I already discussed various causes, uh, multifactorial causes, which could be there. I'd say the first thing needs to be done is get a very experienced 
physiotherapists and occupational therapists and do a home assessment. Um, Jenny, I have to, you know, I like demonstrating things. <laughs> I have yes. seen so many weird things. I've been on the visits, home visits. I do home visits every Friday. And there are such a weird things I'm seeing, which just a little bit of tweaking will prevent that fractured hip. I'll give you a few examples. Again, these are people with cognitive impairment, uh, dementia, uh, who have go away here. So there was a patient who was going with her Zimmer frame, mobilizing it across her room with a Zimmer frame. And actually, she was holding the Zimmer frame in her hand. It wasn't on the floor. She just walking with it. She did not know what to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So these people, another gentleman, I was observing gentlemen coming out of his room. He already had one pull. He was coming out of his room and he was putting his jumper on. He was coming to meet me putting his jumper on and walking. So you can imagine when you're putting jumper on, you will be blinded by the jumper for a few seconds, right? And in front of me, he bumped into the door, into the doorway. Oh, and he, uh, I, I, his daughter caught him in uh, uh, mid-air. So that's the type of things that another home visit, carpet. So this was a home visit, and I actually posted it on his Instagram. A, a gentleman in his late 80s, and he used to be an antique dealer. And his house is like an antique shop. And he's very keen on carpets. Carpet over carpet, third carpet, fourth carpet, so many trip hazards. So that's where to start. It's simple. It sounds like some people might say, well, don't teach their grandma to suck the eggs. But I see that all the time. To me, it seems like a common sense. A first place to start to clear out the hazards. Another one, saving electricity saving money on electricity, having really dimmed balls, walking in darkness, saving electricity, but breaking their hips. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, these are the, yeah absolutely. These are the type of things we need to talk about, first of all. The second one is medication review. Every three, six months, medication review, and it has to be done by a geriatrician because I think um, it, it's, Geriatricians are more trained in understanding the frailty, polypharmacy. Um, even the primary care physicians might not be. I mean, they are good as well, um, obviously being generalists, but it would be better to have polypharmacy review done by a geriatrician. I would say dementia patients have a neurologist, right, to mm -hmm. diagnose and treat their dementia, but they also should have a friendly geriatrician to always see dementia and everything else, because that neurologist is unlikely to be looking at the blood pressure medications or cholesterol medications or treat their arthritis, right? Uh, so that's my second advice. You have a loved one with dementia. Find a friendly geriatrician from the big, who will always see the care of your mom or dad, grandparents from the beginning till the end. Uh, you can, of course, see the specialist, whether it's a cardiologist or your neurologist or pulmonologist, but you do need that generalist view of the person and putting everything together. So that's the next one. Uh, as I said, polypharmacy review. And then, of course, education of the carers. It's a carer education is very important. I run locally, uh, Jenny. I uh, do a lot of charity work with the local patient participation groups and we are um, and my way you've seen my youtube account uh, be your own doctor so i'm doing massive amount of work on educating uh, carers families patients to understand what i'm talking about not just be a receiver of the instructions but also understand why i am asking you to do what i'm asking if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Why so, is always the question I like to have answered. It's, mm -hmm. it's why I'm not good at math. <laughs> I would like to know why I'm supposed to solve for X. And teachers don't like it when I ask that. So <laughs> we, it's interesting that you mentioned the education, because as you know, I am right now between Zoom calls with our lawmakers 
advocating for several new laws and continuing other funding for our health care system, quote unquote health care system. And one of the asks is for payments towards local agencies to educate caregivers. So we're starting to get Don't there. forget about me. Don't forget to mention <laughs> me. I, I can do all those Zoom educations. Okay. Well, this is basically for the, to codify into law a way for doctors, uh, local departments of health. So like all of our um, administrative type agencies, I guess is the right word. So it's really interesting. So there was uh, 80 of us on the first call and I don't know what, I don't know how many will be on the second, but it's, it's education is definitely important, which is why I started my podcast and you're on here. And I think we're finally getting there, but boy, it's taken a lot of, a lot of hard work on a lot of people's parts to, to get this information out there. And your YouTube channel is doing really great. I love it. Yes, please do advertise that as well, uh, Jenny. Whenever we are talking about, you know, you advertise in these sessions, uh, also uh, put my YouTube channel because we will be posting a lot education. It's for you, for the carers, uh, educational material. Now, going back to the false prevention, um, so I wanted to touch on a couple of more, a couple of more things, and that is we can't prevent all falls. And I have dealt with a number of complaints regarding falls where families were upset about mom or dad falling in hospital and putting a complaint against the hospital. And let's face it, we cannot prevent every fall. There are so many factors amalgamate and doesn't matter what you do, the falls in some patients would happen. So my next uh, topic I wanted to touch on is okay, we accept that some falls will happen. What can we do to stop the person fracturing their hip if the fall happened? First of all, the friendly physiotherapist will actually teach you how to fall safely. Uh, did you know that? So well, once- My husband took a motorcycle training class years and years mm-hmm. ago, and they teach you how to basically slide instead of crash. That's so interesting. That's actually a very good comparison. So what you are saying there to me, Jenny, that in his training, they acknowledged that it is impossible to prevent all falls from the motorcycle. And that's exactly what I'm talking about with our patients who are at risk of falls. We are acknowledging we can't stop all the falls, but we can put measures in place to stop the fall causing the fracture and um, the latest statistics showing that about 15% of falls in all the adults result in really serious injury. 15%, that's a lot. That's thousands of patients. So what can we do? The physiotherapist will teach how to fall safely and to teach carers as well how to handle the falling patient and a lot of the carers and relatives tell me how they catch their mom or dad mid-air you know when they're falling well how do you do that without breaking your own back the second thing is bones so that's a important thing to remember you do not wait until you break your hip before we treat your osteoporosis because there are ways to diagnose osteoporosis before you have the fall and you put measures in place to strengthen those bones so when the fall happens you don't fracture your hip and that is bone blood tests checking the calcium levels checking the vitamin d levels parathyroid hormone levels so your primary care physician would know what bloods to do blood tests to do to check the state of your bones give you uh, vitamin d treatment and i am not talking about the supplements here because the supplements you can buy over the counter usually they contain very little amount of vitamin d if but you are seriously vitamin D deficient, you actually need a treatment with high doses of vitamin D, and that can come from your doctor. Um, we do various scans to diagnose osteoporosis. So there are various online tools which we can do, which calculate the risk of osteoporosis. Sometimes you don't even need a, a scan. Uh, in England here, we use so-called 
Frax score, F R A X. Frax score. It's an online calculator. You enter certain details, and then their scoring system tells you what is the risk of osteoporosis in your mom or dad. And that score will then tell you actually the risk is very high. Treat. Or you are halfway, neither here or there. Uh, get your primary care physician to send mom for the scan to know for sure. Or the third option is the risk is very low. Don't worry, everything is fine. Take your vitamin D tablets and calcium supplements and you will be fine. So, yeah, there are tools out there. There's so much can be done to actually stop people fracturing, even if they fall. Not so, mentioning, of course, that vitamin D treatment with calcium can prevent falls and fractures. It's a preventative measure as well. It doesn't just treat osteoporosis. It can, it can reduce the risk of falls and fractures. That's, a, that's interesting to know. <clears throat> Being in California, I have to be careful about how much sunlight I actually get so I don't burn. But I make sure to get outside all the time and get a little sunlight on my skin prior to sunscreen but not too much so that I get burned. So my daughter was on uh, vitamin D, a vitamin D treatment when she was first diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And it is pretty intense. She was taking a pretty large pill, uh -huh. but they uh -huh. had to, I think, test her liver to make sure it wasn't affecting her liver. It gets complicated. So it's best to prevent all of those problems in the beginning. Well, now that you've touched on vitamin D, uh, and we are in the months of May, we have uh, obviously a, 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 a summer ahead of us, uh, I might as well talk about the healthy sun exposure and what actually happens with your vitamin D. So it's important to remember that we accumulate vitamin D during the summer months and we consume during the winter months. So for those of you who want to know what your vitamin D status is like, the best time to check your vitamin D levels on the blood test is in fact October, November. I, I mean, I'm talking about Europe where we have um, the months, the, uh, the autumn, winter, spring. Um, uh, so if we are in Europe, for example, the best time to check is in October, November time, when you had an exposure to sun and subsequently accumulated vitamin D in your body. And we are checking whether you've done enough of it, whether you have enough vitamin D in your blood to last you the winter. If we do your vitamin D levels, let's say in October, November, and the levels are just about normal or on lower side, it's obvious you're not going to last the winter. So you need either supplement or treatment. Um, so that's one tip as far as vitamin D testing is concerned. Um, the second thing is a, a healthy sun exposure. Now, you are very fair lady. You yep. probably burn very quickly, Jenny, right? Yes, I do. So I would say for you, generally, there is an advice out there. If during the summer... This is a government, most governments, that's what they advise. During the summer months, you need to expose your arms and legs to the direct sunlight for 5 to 15 minutes, three times a week. And if you do that, you are likely to accumulate enough vitamin D during the summer months, sun months, when we have most of the sun, enough to last you the winter. So we say five to 15 minutes. If you are a really fair person like Jenny, very, very white skin, you burn easily, then five minutes is enough for you. If you are not that fair, then 15 minutes exposure. Uh, and then you can apply your sunscreen. So a lot of people, I, I observe, um, the minute they hit the beaches, they start putting the sunscreen on. A lot of people are so scared of sun, they apply the sunscreen in the hotel room, in mm -hmm. fact, or in their houses, even before they get out. Well, you're not going to get any vitamin D. They're, currently, the sunscreens are so good. They actually block 90, 95% of ultraviolet heat in your skin. So you are not going to get any vitamin D. 
And I think there, there have been a bit too much of uh, skin cancer scaremongering out there to a degree that we have a now vitamin D deficiency pandemic, if you want, um, which is a real problem, especially in our older patients who are institutionalized. It's a big uh, problem for me. So I once again, I repeat, uh, arm and leg exposure, 5 to 15 minutes, three times a week, what is recommended without sunscreen. And then you can apply your sun protection cream. Well, then I'm doing okay then. Because I check before I go out on the on my bike, I check the UV index. And depending on how high it is, gives me a very big clue as to how long I can be out in the sun without sunscreen <laughs> on. And it's almost always more than 15 minutes. Because mm -hmm. I don't go out in the middle of the day when the sun is at its most intense. So mm -hmm. I think, I'm assuming that you can't get too much vitamin D from the sun. Oh, that's such a good question. And the answer is no. You okay, good. absolutely cannot get intoxicated with vitamin D from sun. No, uh, you can with the tablets. If you overdo with the tablets, and I have seen at least one or two cases where people were overusing vitamin D. And what happens? Vitamin D, it, the function of vitamin D is to improve absorption of calcium from the gut. So if you take too much vitamin D, your calcium levels will go up. You, you understand calcium, Jenny? That, that's a mineral which we need for our bones. It comes from dairy products. So if you take too much vitamin D, your calcium levels will go up and calcium damages the kidneys. So you will have kidney stones and the kidney stones can actually totally kill off your kidneys. And I have seen uh, at least two patients who had to go on dialysis machine mm. because their kidneys were so damaged by overdosing with vitamin D. So uh, it's a wonderful pill, but it, it can actually be lethal if not used appropriately. Well, I try to spend a lot of time outside, but usually under some sort of protection. But what did I get this morning? At least 20 minutes when my legs were in the sunlight. But it was mm -hmm. early, so the UV is low, so I don't run the risk of getting burned. But I do have to mm -hmm. be careful that I don't get oh, burned. Definitely. Oh, definitely, definitely. I, I mean, I, I'm a bit biased because I am mainly seeing that, Jenny, over 90% of my patients are severely vitamin D deficient. So you can see how biased I am when I'm saying, well, there is a lot of skin, uh, uh, sort of some scaremongering going on. Of course, if there is a dermatologist next to me who is treating skin cancers, he will be biased to say, oh, well, we don't want sun, you know, protect yourself. But we, we are looking for a healthy balance. Um, I also wanted to talk about the patients who might be already on the treatment for osteoporosis with medications we call bisphosphonates, um, alendronic acid, zolendronic acid. There are a number of them. We call them bisphosphonates. And of course, the way they work, they want uh, you need to have adequate levels of vitamin D in your body for these medications to work. So that, that's another thing to remember. Um, basically, I would advise at-risk people, those who are on osteoporosis treatment with kidney problems, with liver problems, uh, on multiple medications, recurrent falls, elderly institutionalized people, they should have their vitamin D levels checked at least once yearly. That makes sense. And it makes me feel good that I took my mom to the park regularly. We mostly went to watch kids because that's what she enjoyed doing. But she did get sunlight on her face for probably more than five to 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. at least I didn't realize I knew it was good for her. I didn't realize how good it was for her. So yeah. a little pat on my back today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. For everything else you've done, um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners probably think, well, what about uh, fish? What about mushrooms? Yeah, what about the vitamin D containing foods? Um, so <laughs> I'm sure that question would have come up if we were in audience right now. And uh, while we are on the subject of vitamin D, I might as well mention, yes, it is very important to um, have a balanced diet and have the uh, uh, vitamin D containing foods in your diet, that is fish, mushrooms, eggs, and, and so on. Uh, however, 
even if you eat fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week, 365 days a year, you are still would be vitamin D deficient if you do not have sun exposure because uh, food only provides 10, 15% of vitamin D requirement. Most of the vitamin D comes from, from sun. So if you are trying to compensate the lack of sun exposure with increasing vitamin D containing foods in your diet, it's not quite going to work. That's good because I don't like fish or mushrooms. So <laughs> I better get some sunshine. <laughs> sun for you then, Jenny. Just moderation so I don't end up bright pink because that is not fun. Mm. So are there other fall preventions we should know about before I go back to Zoom call number three for today? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've covered more or less everything, Jenny. I think it's a uh, um, sort of... Uh, yeah, we've we've covered a lot, and uh, I I don't I I did make a list of things, and <laughs> I can of course talk about falls in terms of medical uh, preventative measures, talk about different diagnoses and things like that for hours. But for our listeners, to keep it simple, to keep it um, user friendly, uh, I think we've done we've done it all. That sounds terrific, and that's I I have a couple of topics on the. Be, you know, looking at your home environment, we have a patterned carpet that I swear half of the dog toys blend into. And because <laughs> we have bigger dogs, they have bigger toys. And some of them are like almost toe breakers. They're, they're big and they're hard rubber. And so whenever I see them accumulating in the path, I move them <laughs> because you know they're there and you still step on them or kick them. It's yeah, frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. And then you were talking about saving energy. Of course, most of us have to get up at least once in the middle of the night to use the facility. And I have a tendency to put my hand on the footboard of our bed because of the dogs. I have fallen over and onto the one that passed away last year is the one that got it the worst. But it's not really very kind for a human to land on a dog. <laughs> Not at all, not at all. Jenny, interestingly, I have a 65-year-old under my care right now who tripped over the ball she was using to play with her dog and fell downstairs and broke her neck. So do be careful, please. <laughs> yes, I, I definitely move the dog toys off of the stairs. because it's mm -hmm. And, and I'm that. very careful about the dog. On if they If they're at the top of the stairs and the three of us are going to go downstairs, I let them go first because they kind of fly down and they don't they don't have a care if they bump into me because they're dogs so i just let them go first and then i don't have the i don't run the risk of them bumping into me because they're what 70 and 80 pounds so that's a lot of weight to hit your legs and yeah i'm very careful around the dogs even though i don't have balance issues and i'm 99% certain I don't have any vitamin D issues because I do spend quite a bit of time outside. I mean, we're it's windy again today. I'm like, I'm waiting. It'll be hot soon, but right now it's the thing just, is, though, Jenny, we were talking about preventative measures. You do not wait until you have a fall. And you don't have balance problems now. But if you have an accidental fall over the toy of your dog, and you break something, believe me, you will have balance problems after the fall, even at your age. You know, you are very young, obviously. Um, so uh, don't wait. Don't. Why risk? Why risk it? Nope. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm very careful with the toys. Well, this has been good. I know falls are definitely a concern for all of us, but definitely as we age and those of us that we're caring or are caring for loved ones with dementia. So this is a good topic and we will be discussing. Do we, did you, did you pull out your notes for what we're talking about next time or is it going to be a surprise? Oh, I, I can't remember Jenny, but we can agree now if you want. <laughs> It's up to you. I'm easy. Um, well, we can we can talk about. Um, do you remember we were planning to talk about prevention of dementia mm -hmm. or talk on that subject? So we yeah we can cover that next time. 
That will be terrific. And by the way, there is such a thing is actually possible, but listeners will find that out next time. <laughs> Stay tuned. Well, I appreciate this today. I appreciate you jumping on early so that I could manage both legislative calls today. And we will be back again next month. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. <laughs>